just want you to know that this is for you, Mom. I love you. My name is Michael Munns. I am the Director of Marketing and Advertising for a law firm in Pittsburgh. We'll leave them on name for now just in case any of you are uh, undercover agents from other competitive law firms. Um, nonetheless, what we're here to talk about today, and you all may be as intrigued by my title as I was when I wrote it because it happened pretty fast, it's the SE evolution, or as I like to put it, it's an SEO evolution. I kind of just put the words together, they look good. But nonetheless, the subtitle of it was what is, what was, and what shall be. And uh, a couple things I want to clarify right now and get out of the way is if any of you guys have come here looking for the magic recipe or expect <laughs> to leave here with a, a potion or some kind of a, a, a map or a how-to on how to put your website or your blog or your company at the number one ranking, I have something for you. I do. This is state-of-the-art magic SEO dust. <laughs> and I want you to take some of these. Here you go. And actually, we're going to do it like this. I want you guys to pass this around. And everyone get a little dust because you're going to need it when you leave. This is easily applied. This is easily applied to your computer. You just open it up and uh, dump it on your keyboard. And it magically gets you to the number one ranking. You guys want to pass some of these down to the middle corner, please? Let me get another handful. Here's a couple more, guys. So don't eat them all now, because you're going to eat them when you get back to work and get back to class. They're definitely going to be the part that helps you out the most. And I mean this kind of like as an analogy and kind of as a metaphor, but I can tell you from working here and doing podcast sessions in the past, I slow down, that you're not going to come here looking for an answer that's going to put you at number one. And I want to get that clear from the door. Pass it down, pass them around, don't hog up all the magic. <laughs> pass the magic around, guys. Am I find anybody leaving with bags of magic? Can you pass these real behind you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Make sure you guys get some. More. <laughs> Is there anybody that hasn't gotten their SEO magic yet? Because I don't want anybody leaving here without some magic. Uh, you, some magic? you want some magic? Wait, you play Magic the Gathering. All right, so all joking aside, guys, the, the, the concept of today's, of today's little seminar slash my profit preaching is less about what you can do to your website and more about what you can do to your mindset to put you in the right place. I'm not going to sit here and talk to you about title tags. I'm not going to sit here and talk to you about H1s. I'm not going to tell you about linking in a general sense. What I'm going to try and get you to do is to start thinking a lot like the search engines want you to think, and more so how your customers want you to think. So that's what kind of led me to my title. A lot of us in here, and, and by a show of hands, how many people in here are familiar with the term SEO? All right, good. It's good to see that most people are. For those of you who aren't, it's search engine optimization. And I, I joked around at first, but I was going to put a list of words we don't talk about. And optimization is one of them. To me, optimization in a web sense is almost a, a synonym of the word manipulation, which is a very bad thing when it comes to search engines. You do not want to be the person that's trying to trick the search engines, trying to outdo the next person with some kind of magic dust. What you need to do is you need to remember that it's more about your customer than it is the search engines, but they work together. So with SEO, that's where I came up with the SEO evolution. It's really, really changed. PodCamp, I've done this now seven years, and I've kind of done a seminar or a, a class about SEO for each one. And it literally, our tools, our tips, our tricks, and our techniques have all morphed into different avenues. Some of the ones that we used to use some of the, the methods of <coughs> highlighting words, creating strong anchor text, matching it to page titles, using keyword specific URLs, meaning like I'm PittsburghLawyer.com. Those have fallen by the wayside as applicable immediate remedies for search engine optimization. Or ultimately, I know everyone in here, you can lie to me, you're trying to get your website, your blog, or your company seen in front of people. So the first part I want to talk about is the what was. That's the simplest one to discuss. Some of the stuff that we used to do to go ahead and manipulate the search engines or optimize our websites was linking. I'm going to refer to Google a lot in this class for two reasons. For one, Google consumes 80% of the internet. 
Almost every search done is done on Google. <coughs> and on top of that, Google has also taken a stance to, in their mind, purify search. Take away the ability for people like us to come together, formulate our magic dust recipe, and go out and manipulate the websites to get ourselves to the top. They've almost made it impossible to do it at this point. As a matter of fact, not only do they make it impossible, but they're handing out citations. And I don't know how many of you are, are steeped in every day of Google, but you can get blacklisted. You can have your website kicked off the search engine. And if you're kicked off the 80% of internet traffic, you better believe you're in trouble. You have a lot of stuff to do. So a lot of this, what Google is starting to regulate, has started with linking. There used to be a time where you could go to submitmywebsite.com, get 150 links. You're suddenly at the top of the search engines. There's a time you could go to a company and you could buy links. You may be, and, and, and let, me, let me specify buying links. I work for a law firm. There's a company called hg.org that is a online directory of law firms that they require a payment to join their directory. That is not the same style of paid link that I'm discussing. What I'm talking about is when you find a company in India, Afghanistan, somewhere else, that you're paying for 10,000 link backs to your website from a PR9, and that PR is standing for page rank. A lot of BS there. So what Google has kind of started to say is we want to make sure that you have earned that link. We don't want you just to go out and buy them. We want to make sure that you've <laughs> earned that link. And that, that concept is where I'm going to start because that's kind of what the whole internet marketing atmosphere and environment has changed to. It's less about what you can add to your site to make it better and more about what value you can add to Google. Any of you that, that, that deny yourselves the truth that Google is a real estate company are lying to yourself. Google cares about who shows up number one, two, and three on their website. That's the space they're selling. They're selling that space. They're also selling the organic listings below the top of the ads. <coughs> now, I don't know how many of you are, are like I said again, steeped in Google where every day you're watching it. But you'll notice that Google started to expand spaces. They're pushing the organic results underneath the fold of your screen, unless you have a screen that's this big. So what they've started to do is manipulate what actually comes up in the top portion of a search result. Of course, their paid results are coming up first because people are paying to be there. But what they've kind of started to do is they've widened the space between the search box and the top <coughs> of the paid listings. It's so subtle that you don't realize it because it's something you use every day and you don't see the two to three megapixels, they're inching it down at a time. In that same breath, the paid advertisements, we all remember how they were uh, easily recognized, the giant yellow background. How easily recognized are they now? I mean, they've faded out the color of it. I mean, this is, this is happening before. This isn't your monitor. This isn't your eyes. This is something that Google is purposely doing to control their environment, which is smart. They want you to pay to be on their site. They want you to use their tools to be on their site. So. Tying this back to linking, one of the things that Google is looking to do on their list, and then, you know, if you guys are going to take notes, I would say <coughs> the first one to start off with is real links to real directories that are actually applicable to you. You don't want to submit my websites. You don't want, you know, freewebblinks.com. And there's some interesting tools that have come to use in Google Analytics and Google Webmaster to help you look at these links. Some of the other tools besides those to help validate the links, and I'm make sure I get it right because I have to think it through. Google Webmaster has a printable link directory that you can get every link to your website. I think it's three years back. And it'll literally, I mean, like if you have 50,000 links, expect to use a real paper. And it literally gives you the URL for every one of the websites that link to your website. There's some websites that you may not have ever linked to, but somehow they have found you through spidering the internet, assimilating whatever your profession, whatever your key thought is. If you're trying to push recipes for pasta, Google has automatically and other entities have found out that you're looking at pasta, so they're gonna put you on pages that pertain to pasta. Some of these sites are malicious, and there's not a lot you can do to it. Google's given us the ability now to say, hey listen, we realize that some of you guys have stuff linked to you that you can't get rid of. I mean, some of these companies don't even have unsubscribes that you can send anything to. Google's created what's called a disavow link forum disavow link area on their websites. I will tell any of you, this is, I'm going to keep this real shallow because I don't want to get deep in the code, but if you use the disavow links on Google, there is a specific format that you have to follow. It's very code driven. If you do it wrong, then it won't disavow the link. They won't even look at it. It's just kind of like you just tried for nothing. So take some time to kind of learn a little bit about how to disavow 
bad links on your website. And, and this is a great segue to, well, how do I know what links are bad? There are some other tools out there that will help you to figure out exactly the value of your link. And what I mean by the value is we've all kind of started to see how Google is moving towards like a trust basis. You've now become a, a, a source of information about a specific topic. You know, we have the Google author recognition that you can now show up on the first page with a picture of yourself and it'll give a list of stuff you've contributed by using Google+. They're going to start to utilize that to validate not just websites, but links that come to your website. So let's say I'll, I'll pick on Chris for, or uh, Sean for a second. I'll say, hey, listen, um, if you're linking to my website, make sure that it's pertinent because if not, it's going to end up hurting me. Well, if he falls off the end of the earth, I never see him again. And yet his site becomes, you know, spammy and taken over and then they're linking to me. They're no longer going to value him as a source of information. They're going to devalue my website for that link. So it's kind of like what your friend does will affect you unless you can get it disavowed. This trust thing is something I'm going to keep coming back to because something that we all have to realize, and, and it goes back to acquisitions that Google's made. I mean, Google's been around for a while. You remember Google bought YouTube. Is it an accident that Google bought YouTube? No. Is it an accident that Google is slowly integrating video results into a search? No. How do I get myself there? Well, I have a Vivo and a Blip, and I might be over here on a Facebook video. I might even have an Instagram. And uh, I'll tell you, and you can argue up and down with me about it. Google's going to give preferential treatment to people utilizing their tools. It makes sense to them. So you look at, you know, if I have a YouTube channel, will it get more recognition than maybe a Vivo channel or a Blip channel? Absolutely. You, they will never tell you to your face that it will. But I've spent years A and B testing things. Hey, let's try it with this and see what this happens. And I can tell you that it does matter. So going back to the real estate, linking is going to help control how you're able to be evaluated to show up in Google's real estate. Because ultimately, keep in mind that it's about who you are, what you do, meaning consistency and longevity of your information. If you are a website that's been doing pasta recipes, you don't all of a sudden want to start talking about toxic toads. You want to keep it on point. Why? Because Google's going to say, hey, listen, um, somebody just Googled pasta recipes. Why should I show your website over his website? Oh, well, let's look at your links first, and let's keep running down the list and see where there's a problem with your site that doesn't match what our guidelines are. Let's see if you're considered a source of information on this topic. Have you utilized all the tools at your disposal to become a source of information? So the, the next thing after linking I'm going to talk about is going to be coding. And I'm only going to touch on coding for a second because I don't want to get real deep into it. There is significance in how you code your website. I had a great conversation last night with the guys from Boss Junk about how we can utilize audio ID3 tags to benefit us online. An ID3 tag, anytime you guys stick a CD in a CD player, you see the name of the group come up. Sometimes you see lyrics come up. Those are files built into an audio file that are keyword rich and perfect content for you to put online. We're going to come back to that word content. Ultimately, what we're looking at with the coding is if you were to write, uh, let's say we're going to record this today and we're going to put it back online. I wouldn't say Mike Munn's talking about web stuff. I would say the title of this would be Mike Munn's talking about a little bit about the evolution of SEO and how it can help gain interest and rank on my website. Hopefully that title would come over to the ID3 tag. And so when Google was looking for people talking about SEO, I would come up because that's in my title. So Google's going to say, hey, look, there's a title there. I'm trying to, to correlate to you the importance of the titles of all of your files. I can probably guess half of you have header files on your websites or on your blogs that are called header image one, header image one JPEG, or something along those lines. It's important to even name image files keyword rich. There is a difference between keyword rich and there's a difference between spamming. And it's almost like saying, I am a Pittsburgh criminal defense attorney and lawyers in Pennsylvania. is way too much. Something simple as criminal defense attorney would be a very nice, polite title tag you want to associate to a file. If your website is about cooking pasta, maybe pasta recipes for everybody. Maybe gluten-free pasta recipes should be the title of your header image. What I'm trying to instill upon you guys is... The devil's in the details. There's minutia involved with all these validations that Google's doing to put you at the top of the website, put you at the top of the search engine, rather. They're looking at your linking. They're looking at your coding. 
Now, I talked a little bit about file names because it's something I think a lot of people overlook. Because it's something that either you're not a developer, you're not a designer, but you're more of a marketer or strictly using it for optimization purposes. It's a great way to kind of get yourself a legitimate way to move ahead of some of your competition. And I mean, it's not hard to figure out who your competition is, whether you're a mommy blogger or a, a carpet installation company. There are tools online you can use to see what your competition is doing. You see them every day. I mean, this is a what have I done for you lately type of business. If I tell you I'm going to put you at the top of a search engine under a keyword, what are you going to do? You can go look. So you can't BS. You can't hide it. You can't log into Google and all of a sudden make it chill up because Google knows you've been there before. So, I mean, there's some, there's some, some ways you really need to, to look at your competition and kind of take what you know you need to do and what you're missing and see where your competition lies with that. Like I said, even for a mommy blogger or somebody sharing something as simple as recipes, you have competition because you want to come up in front of a select group of people. So there are other, other people that share that same concept with you, believe it or not. It's pretty big WWW. So ultimately you want to kind of come up in that group or come up as a re, the, the head resource of information. You consider yourself to be very credible at what you do. <coughs> Coding also has a lot to do with, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on title tags for a second. Google likes to answer questions. If you start to look at some of your keywords on your analytics of what people are searching, you're going to see that there's been a migration, an evolution from Pittsburgh DUI attorney to what are the sentences for my first DUI. People will try and go ahead and answer a question, and it's being forced upon us because if you look at your devices, you have Siri who answers questions. So what I start to tell people about coding titles of pages is keep the concept of your page, DUI attorney, as your title. But you should have subtitles on that page that should answer common questions that your customers want to know. What are the DUI sentencing alternatives? What are the mandatories? Those are questions that I, I use as subtitles. You know, I, instead of it just talking about it, I say the, the alternatives to DUI sentencing is, is one, or what can I expect if my license gets suspended? You'll start to see, and if you look in your analytics, you'll start to see this migration over there. So touching, again, on the coding portion of this, you want to start to write for your customer's need. Think of yourself as your customer. Don't think of yourself as a knowledgeable person in that field for a second. Divorce yourself from that mentality and think about how your customers think. Think to, about what would I search? What would be important to me if this was for me? What about my cousin, my uncle, my sister, my brother? What would be important to know? What are the details? Because each one of us has a, a device in our hand and I guarantee that that's how that search is going to be done. I'm going to touch for a second real deep on something called schema coding or rich text snippets. This is an evolving technology. This is based solely on GPS devices and Siri. These are the, the people leading this. And what it is, is it breaks down an address where you may have your address as Pittsburgh, PA, and that may be how it's listed on your Google Maps. That may be how it's listed on all of your stuff that you, your letterhead. What GPS needs to know and what Siri needs to know is and I'll move out of the way in a second. And I'm only going to do this for this. We're not going to talk about any more code. What they want to know is what's your locale and what's your region. Because the way they parse information <coughs> is different than what a search engine is looking for. But yet, if you look at statistics on your analytics, you'll see that how many iOS devices are coming to your website. The one that's still variable that I think is pretty cool that's going to be the next this is your, you can use your little pixie dust, is the emergence of maps and GPS into search. Google Local Business has started to adopt it. Approximation search, meaning that you don't even have to type in lawyer in Pittsburgh. You can just type in lawyer. And based on your proximity, the search engines know where you're at. So not only are you writing it on your page in this method, but then you're writing it in the code in this method. This one's for the search engines, this one's for geolocation devices. It's called schema, S-C-H-E-M-A. <laughs> there are a couple other rich text formats you can use, but I can tell you from experience, schema seems to be the one that's the most widely accepted. So I'll, I, I'm not going to write any more code, I promise. So 
once again, we started off talking about linking. We just addressed a couple new ideas and a couple things you should be looking out for in coding with regards to optimization. Remember, I'm not here telling you what code you need to write. I'm not here telling you what words you need to use. I'm changing the way you guys think about addressing your customers because that's where the, the magic is going to happen, not in that little pixie stick. So we look at the two what was's. These are where our past was here. We've discovered, kind of walked into the what is with the schemas, with the coding. We talked about linking and how Google's kind of looking at how valuable is that link to you. This trust issue I want to talk about for a second because this is a very, we got to a great conversation last night about what are your, what are your social media necessities for a business, for a blog, for you? What are your social media necessities? And they're pretty simple. I mean, we all have a Twitter account for ourselves, for our business, for our blog. And if you don't, you should. Most of us have a Facebook account of some sorts for yourself and for your business. And if you don't, you should. The other one I'm going to talk about and I'm going to really harp on is Google+. If you're not using Google+, shame on you. It's not hard to use. And remember who that giant in the room was? Remember how much Google liked to use their own stuff with YouTube? Remember how I talked about Google's going to get preferential treatment to people that utilize their social signals? There's their biggest social signal. And the value behind Google Plus is that it's twofold. There are two pieces of information that come from a Google Plus entity. The first is a Google Plus page. The second is a Google Plus profile. I know I'm going to say this fast because we're going to talk a little bit about both of those. If you have a blog, if you have a company, you need to have a page in addition to a profile. Why this is important? We're going to talk about the profile as our publisher. We're going to talk about our page as our <coughs> author. Did I get that right? No, I got that backwards. No, I got that right. Your Google profile. No, I did get it backwards. Backwards. It's because I have it written upside down. Your Google profile is about you. It's about Mike. It's about Sean. It's about Mike. For all the rest of you, I can't read your name tags. Alex. It's about all of you. That's your Google profile. It talks about who you are, what you're interested in. What have you contributed to the internet? There's portions on Google Plus profiles that you can add contributions. And for every one of you that's a web designer, for every one of you that's a blogger, your contributions are your web pages. And every one of your web pages should be listed on your Google Plus profile. Now, in addition to your Google Plus profile of you, you have the ability to add a page for your website or business or blog. Meaning that the page serves more as the media entity that you're, you're communicating with. Sure, you can write stuff and share stuff from your profile, but your page is a business-oriented or a, uh, it's just a business-oriented environment. It's, it's really where you put your hours of operation, who you are, what you do. And the correlation between these two is so important because, oh, I lied, we're talking about code again. In code, on this site, Google will provide you with a snippet like they do for their tracking for a Google Plus profile as well as a Google Plus page. Now, think of it in a hierarchy. You are the profile, so you are the author. Publish is what you've published. So if you're going to go ahead and create a Google Plus page for your company, and I'll just use Sean as, a, as an incident here. If he's going to do something for his website, he's going to create a Google Plus page for his website that, sh that shows his business and what he does. What this is going to do is it's going to say, hey, wait, there is an author out there, Sean Graham profile, Mike Munn's profile, that talks about, wait, here it is, seg segue immediately to the page that's linked to our profile. Now, what I mean by linked is if you go to your Google Plus and you click your drop-down box, you'll see pages on your left-hand side. It'll be one of your options. And every time you add a page that's a business entity, you're immediately tied to and assimilated to that in Google's eyes. So what Google says is, hey, listen, Mike Munns talks a lot about law. He always is publishing and contributing all this information and all these web pages about law. And it looks like, oh wait, here on his pages, he has a personal injury website, he has a criminal law website, and he has a, a license help website. All of these are law related. So what Google starts to say is, he might be a credible source of information about this law thing. 
So when somebody would Google law or information pertaining, I'm just being general with that thought, Google's going to, once again, put me up to that evaluation and say, how's my linking? How's my coding? But most of all, let's look at these social signals. And first and foremost, because they're not going to go to Facebook or Twitter first, they have, they are Google, Google+. Plus. They're going to start in their own backyard. How much have they manipulated what I've given them to do? Have they gone ahead and created a Google Plus profile for themselves? Have they linked every one of the web pages they've ever written to that Google Plus profile? And on top of that, have they even gone as far as sharing with me what it is they want to get out of this? What's their goal? Have they shown me a company, an entity, a blog? And how well is that put together? So they show a correlation between what you talk about and what you provide. And for those of you who do Google searches, and you can go on there, online right now, Google anything, and you're going to see little pictures of people come up next to a description. We all seen that? Everybody has seen that. Okay. That picture comes from your profile. Even though that's your website that shows up, <coughs> that picture that shows up next to the description of your website says Mike Munns, written by. And then you can click on that to take you to other contributions that my profile has contributed. So Google automatically starts to say, hmm, I have these guys here. They linked correctly. They coded co correctly. They really got a good chance to use all the tools I've given them. I'm going to give them a preferential rank over somebody else. It's a basic concept. If I'm working with a company, I want to use as much of their stuff as I can. You know, I'm, I'm not going to go to Crayola and use some knockoff crayons. I'm going to use Crayola crayons. So... There are code snippets on your Google profile page that you can add to an author tag, it's called. There is a code snippet provided for your website that's considered a publisher tag. And that's where I told you I promised I wouldn't talk about them again, but inadvertently, they're just codes that go up there. And what that tells them, what that tells Google when they send their spider across is, hey, listen, this is what he's using. Now, I won't talk as much about Facebook and Twitter because I think we've beat them into the ground. <laughs> I have really jaded thoughts about both of them. But what I can tell you is, at this point, you can tell me all day long that you think social media is doing something for your company. You may even have a couple phone calls or a couple analytics that are going to show me you've got some more readers that show me you gained a couple things. What I'm going to tell you is the majority of people in a, in a room like this want to see ROI. They want to see their phone ringing. You can be number one if your phone's ringing. It doesn't matter. They want to see value in what they're spending their time and their dollars on. The value behind these social signals is that it's better to leave no stone unturned. Because you don't know when the next person may decide to find you through Facebook. Maybe they don't buy, maybe they do. Maybe they leave a comment, maybe they download your article, maybe they stream your podcast. Same thing with Twitter. Maybe you don't know if you're going to find a client through Twitter. I mean, the ability, I think, for Twitter to convert to business is extremely difficult for the majority of businesses out there because... People tend to want to put their guard down and talk to people. They don't want to be pitched. Always pitched. Always calling me. Telling me you can get me to talk. This stupid recording from Google Plus Services that calls me at least three times a day. Ugh. They, they, want to, they, want to, they want to sell you their stuff. Ultimately, it's good to be there. If you can prove to yourself that it's a valuable tool to reach the group of people you're trying to reach, whether it's to share information or sell things is where you need to make a decision on how to utilize that social media for yourself. So talking about the kind of the what is and the social signals and how they're going to work, yes, post Twitters, yes, post Facebooks, yes, post Google Pluses. But even more so, like I, like I like to call it, it's called a social media mill. <coughs> Bless you. The social media mill is pretty simple. Google is going to look for cer certain social signals because you know they know how important this is. They know how important this is, but they also realize the value of these other two. They know that the, the power is in the masses there. So what they're going to do is they're going to identify pretty much these three. And believe it or not, Yelp has become a social signal. I didn't remember asking the questions. Write it down. <laughs> I don't remember. And anyhow, so the social signals are, are important to the degree that they're going to kind of have to be things you have to have in your toolbox. When I talk about the social media mill, it's a very simple concept. Every time you publish something to the internet, I don't care where you do it, I don't care how long it is, if it's specific on the topic that you're trying to influence people with, you need to first post it on your website. Then you need to create a 140 character offering to put us on Twitter. Cut and paste it, put it right on Google Plus and share it with everybody. And at the same time, might as well cut and paste it and put it on Facebook. 
that one article that you've written, you've done so much with. You've created a, a valuable, keyword-rich, topic-oriented content on your site. You've linked it out to who Google wants you to link it out to. You've even gone as far as to throw it into other social media signal circles to try and get it to spread. So you've created one link, two links, three links, and your website, four links that are accepted because they're good from one article. Now, this is where I segue to my favorite part about web design, about SEO. This is the hardest word here. Content. I hear laughing. So I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a web design meeting, a, a promo, a pitch. Great meeting with these people. They were super passionate about what they wanted to do. I clearly identified what their responsibilities were. Their responsibilities to my clients are to share their passion via content. I'm not the plumber. I'm not the carpet finisher. I'm not the, the home builder. I'm not the mommy blogger. I'm the web guy. I don't have an inkling of love like you do for what your specific topic you're trying to influence is. And far be it for me to lie to you and tell you that, yeah, sure, I can write you some content. Because who are we writing our content for? Our customers. If I write it, I'm writing it with all this knowledge and it never comes out of it. It sounds like I'm a robot and come to my website and come, please, please buy from me. <coughs> I've used every button. Please push them. Content, my very first pod camp was recycled media marketing. And I stand by that. I guarantee you right now on your website, you have enough content that you could break apart and regurgitate to people to get yourself through to the next six months. A lot of you that work for companies have TV spots. They're sitting on VHS somewhere in a drawer. You have spreadsheets and propaganda that you used to leave around people's offices, mailers that you sent out to people. Every one of those has the ability to become a document because you can take an audio file, have it dictated, there's, there's document, audio file, Take that audio file, upload it to uh, YouTube with a still image of your phone number and how to get a hold of you, maybe a couple cool pictures that scroll across. There's your video. Now you've just created audio, video, and actual word content from one thing you had laying around. Does it suck to do? Yeah. Sometimes dictating and copying down an hour and 15 minute video isn't the best thing to do. You get in charge for that. But sometimes you have something simple as like a 30 second TV spot that's just kind of going out there. And the, when you write it down, you look at it, you're like, this isn't going to mean anything. How is this going to help? The search engines, and this is where I'm going to deviate from just Google, the search engines don't care about the length of your content. What they care about is the frequency and the consistency. How often are you providing new content? Once again, a, an absolute that I can tell you is that many of you that have websites have an About Me page have a contact us page, have mission statement pages. Those are the foundations of your website. They never change. You can't do anything with them. They're not going to do anything else for you. They're just a foundation to which you build upon. So a blog or events or questions and answers or forums or wikis are the best way that you're going to be able to provide fresh content to your website. Because you can't keep adding about us pages. Maybe you hire some more people, throw some more profile pages on there. So. It's really important to understand where to get your content from and how to get it. I, I, I tell people to start with something simple. We talked about the, the coding of the header tags. I have people that will write great 14 paragraph pages come running to me and say, oh, I got you some content. And then when I post it, I post the first paragraph and I put a subtitle on it. Well, that's not all what I wrote. Well, did you want me to put all 14 paragraphs there? Or did you, you going to write me another one of these? And this is where you start to realize that their passion doesn't burn out. There's just not enough time in the day to run the company, answer phones, write about what's important to your company and what, what's important to you. And so I'm going to tie this back together from where we talked about our coding and our questions to our content regarding our length and what we talk about. Your customers have questions. I'm not telling them how to fix the car on the internet. I'm not telling them how to get out of the speeding ticket on the internet. I'm merely answering a basic question. What is a misdemeanor? What does it mean to me? What is a felony? How can I, what can I expect from it? Those types of questions, you know, what is the, what pan do I use for making my sauce? Those are questions that you can start to build content with. You could put out two or three lines because remember, once we publish it, sometimes two or three lines are all that fit. So you start to take these questions and feed them to the world. 
And how you figure out if it's the right question is just look at your analytics. How many people look at this page? Am I off? Did I word it wrong? Is this, does it need to be said differently? Because once again, who are you writing for? You're writing for your customers. You're not writing for the search engines. And sometimes your customers just want a quick little anecdotal question answered. Sometimes they just need to know if I, my license is suspended in PA, can I get one in Ohio? Keyword string about seven words long. How do I write that? Well, you know what? If I see it enough on my analytics, I'm going to write an article titled How to Drive in Ohio with a Suspended License in PA. And I started off how. So people are automatically going to start to answer a question. So for everybody out there that gets bottlenecked in content, start with old stuff that's laying around that hasn't been utilized in a long time. Because the chances are that if it's like pre 2K, it hasn't been published. Maybe not some pre 2002 these days. So, I mean, you're looking at anything that's old, reuse. You have it there. Don't go and sit in front of your boss's office, write him an article, and let it sit on his desk. I'm a big stickler for giving somebody a list of things to do. And if they get stuck at the first one, they don't even bother to go on to the other two. Figure out ways to manipulate and, and create content. And that's where the manipulation can come in, is you need to be able to, to provide fresh and new. Talked with this about with some of you guys very intensely to the degree of figuring out what exactly it is I pull out. Reviews are good. Results are good. All these are good ideas to generate content. Because once again, every time I write content about a specific topic, it goes here, here, and here, and on my website. So when somebody Googles or Yahoo's or Bing's that topic, you're going to be the person that is considered a valuable contributor to that information. Content is king. It never went away. It never lost its reign. It has always been the primary way to get to the top of the search engines. Sprinkle that on your keyboard with your fingers, because that's the only way you're going to get to the top. Content, content, content. I work in law. Our competition has 2,116 pages of content-specific information on his site. I'm working with like 189. So content is king, and there's a reason that this person sits at the top of the search engines. If you provide that much content that's specific to a, a, a topic, Google's going to be like, you must know something. So we talked about the frequency and the consistency. Frequency meaning don't go out. Everyone's going to come out of here. Woo, going to write a whole bunch of stuff this week. You're going to crank out two or three articles this week. You're going to get maybe one out next week and right into the wall. You're all going to stop writing. You're not going to be as passionate about it because life gets in your way. It's a simple concept that happens to all of us. This is where the frequency comes into play. Google is looking to put people up that have consistently fresh content. If you abandon fresh content, Google will abandon you because you're not giving them anything of value. As much as we've done the SEO evolution is as much as the entire web has evolved. And now kind of what we're looking for may not be the same way we looked for it before. We may not use the same media channel as we did before. It's important to not leave any stone unturned. Do it often. I'd say, in all honesty, if you can get one good three to five paragraph page from whoever is creating your content, cut it in half. Two posts a week. Can you manage to do three sentences a week? A post can be short. Can you manage 140 characters? Oh, I'm sorry, 280 characters a week about your topic. I mean, as you start to dilute it down, you start to see the simplicity behind what you're doing. And everyone gets so caught up in the word content, like i got to write this long page. No, you just need to give them a little bit so they remember to come back. <clears throat> so what ends up happening is Google starts to say, this person about this topic has consistently provided me with new information. So when you, the customer, searches for a driver's license attorney, they're going to go to the person that's put something out twice a week, that's followed all the coding, that's linked correctly, that has content that's right on topic. Versus the person that has kind of just thrown something together and put it up there. And I go back to the fact that the biggest part of SEO is understanding and identifying your competition. Finding out where they are on this path of, of optimization. <clears throat> Sometimes we'll be ahead of you in some areas. Like I said, I have a client or I have a comp competitor that has 2,100 pages. I have 189. Crushes me in most of the words, except the ones that I specifically broke down niche information about and talked about specifically. The battle isn't always to be number one. The battle is to understand where to be number one. 
And I think that's where we're going to kind of start to segue our way out of here. I'm going to get some questions and answers here. I'm going to get to the end of the session. Understanding where is the right place to be. You have some great tools out there for you. First and foremost, you have Google Webmaster. If you're not using Google Webmaster, start using Google Webmaster. It's easy to use. It's free. And what it will do is it will tell you this top search queries that have been done in your geographic area that pertain to your website. Sometimes you're going to see very meager numbers. I mean, we're talking about Pittsburgh. People have this misconception. First of all, I'm not paying $12 for a beer. This is not New York. Okay? Second of all, this is a little town. You can walk across it in about 10 minutes. And everyone knows everyone. So keep in mind that it's that this big town mentality that we have here isn't going to show on the internet either. There's only X amount of people that could possibly have lost their license in the last week that need my help. There's only so, not, so many people that slipped and fell. So, I mean, understand that you're working from a small pool to begin with. Getting, getting niche-oriented, I knew I wasn't going to say, but getting niche-oriented is very important. And the, the perfect case in point is this. I do a criminal defense website. One of the biggest dead pieces of weight on the website, because you think criminal is like rape, drugs, guns, theft, fraud, driver's licensing problems, needs a criminal defense lawyer. So we had this entire entity of driver's license that was just kind of holding down the site chopped it off, built a new URL. And one of the things I noticed when I did it, and you, you know, it's, it's easy to, to take a look at something where you do five different things and figure out which one could be its own vertical. I was blessed because it was real simple. It, it was amazing that the difference. The criminal website went up in rank because it didn't have such a vast array of information on it. And the license help website that I built, proudest thing I've done. I think if I do a year and a half span on my analytics, my bounce rate might be 0.3%. 0.3%. Bounce rate, great word, very important for everybody in here. Bounce rate is the amount of people that come to your site, hate it, and leave. It's simple. If you're not writing good content for them, they're not going to stay. So a high bounce rate means it's, it's the worst thing for you. It means you're getting the customers there, but they're leaving when they get there. Your salesman sucks. But guess what? It's a website. It's open 24 hours a day, and the salesman does exactly what you tell him to because you're him or her. So understanding how to gauge what you need is going to be difficult until you can identify what verticals you can influence. Obviously, if you're doing pasta recipes, you could talk to people about the noodle, about the sauce, about the cheese, maybe wine pairings. And then once you add something like that, wine pairings, that kind of become something different than what your core was. Why not spin it off into a topic that you could have a site about its own information and it would stand on its own two feet? And being like I said, we're in Pittsburgh, there's only a small pool of people. You don't want to go out there trying to catch everybody. If I can identify a demographic that's smaller than the general and attack that specific niche, I'm going to get further ahead on the internet. Why? Because my linking, my coding, and my content, and all my social signals are going to be focused onto one area instead of onto a breadth of similar topics. A lot of you guys might look at your website and say, but yeah, linking is, is part of SEO, and consulting is part of SEO, and SEO is part of SEO. Well, actually, you could probably take linking and make it its own website and provide information about that. Same with content. Each one of these topics could stand alone on their own feet. So identify micro niches within your website and break off those sites and launch them on their own. It becomes burdensome at first because you have a whole other child to deal with, we'll say. But at the same time, the ROI on that comes a lot faster and is a lot quickly, more quickly identified. All right, so the last part we're going to talk about, and this is where we're segue to interaction, is what shall be. Where, what is, what's this internet thing going to be in the next three years? I mean, Back to PodCamp 1, PodCamp 2, what was it then? You know, now we started PodCamp, audio was a big deal on our phones. Ooh, I had a 2.1 megapixel camera. That was the BMOC. Now you can run a 15 second HD video on your phone and probably in the next year do a 3D printout of whatever you just saw. So, I mean, the, the technology has le leapt ahead so fast. I think that it's created some, some voids. I think it's created an entire group of people who have been abreast of the technology, but just don't know how to leverage it. And I brought up a, uh, a great question. I think I mentioned this to you last night, and I'll mention it to everyone here. What's the difference between a Vine video and an Instagram video? To me, it's like buying a Honda or a, a Toyota. 
there's, you're just going with a brand. There's no value difference in either one. It's another one of those social signals that everyone's going to use. Does that mean I have to have a Vine? I have to have an Instagram? Probably won't hurt. Remember, don't leave that stone unturned. Put yourself out there. But at the same time, where's the value in the two? Which one do I use and why? So when we're talking about what shall be, there's some big names out there where we're going. I mean, you guys are starting to see the evolution. We had a search engine get involved in social media. Google Plus was the largest search engine. They went ahead and saw the bandwagon from our good old friends here at Facebook and said, hey, we want to be social too. And then our good old friends at Facebook said, hold on a second, we're going to incorporate some search into this. So then you had a social entity that was getting into search. And all the while, creeping up from the behind, was our good friend, Amazon. Because what happened? Well, our good friend, the search engine that got involved in social media, had this entity on it called Shopping. And they were just giving it away. You could just post whatever you want there, and Google was taking nothing. They said, wait a second, look at this Amazon business model. We're missing something here. Let's re-identify how we approach this. And for those of you that are familiar, that's pretty much what the new Google Pittsburgh hiring had a lot to do with was their shopping cart. They were really trying to get a better experience altogether with regards to shopping. And that's where we saw a search engine turn into an e-commerce site. Well, I bring up Amazon because Amazon, I mean, they're Amazon, huge. They sell everything, anything. And they went ahead and got involved in the tablet game. Kind of like a pitch from out, out of nowhere. We're starting to look at maybe now Amazon is going to push another bookstore out. You think Amazon's eventually going to take Barnes & Noble over? And throw another tablet up underneath their belt with the milk? They put orders out of business, that's for sure. Anybody that doesn't believe that? There's some great business stories in Forbes about how Amazon pushed orders out. And how do you compete with something that gives you books that cheap? So identify the players in our future. These are the ones that we know of. Now, seven months ago, who was Vine? A year ago, what was Instagram? Well, two years ago, what was Instagram? Mm -hmm. These were names we had no clue of. Now, every, I guarantee almost every device in here has an app for either of those. And I guarantee when you go to use it, you're like, Instagram Vine, Instagram Vine. What picture, what picture do I use for Twitter? Do I use Frog or do I use Twitter? You know, you're, you're stuck with all these choices. And, and my best advice to you is use them all. Put your name on every one of those stones in the river. Identify where you think this is going to go. I mean, you see in front of you, what have you bought in the last year? You bought uh, a phone slash camera slash GPS slash music device that does all this stuff for you. Start looking at your analytics and start looking at how the screen resolutions and operating systems are starting to diversify. Screen resolution meaning you're seeing people using 10-inch tablets, 7-inch tablets. Uh, the, the notes, you're going to see these screen sizes. So understand that your design of your website needs to accommodate them. Understand that all these environments are starting to take over what used to just be your desktop or laptop. So where do we think this is going to go? Where do we where do we see it mer morphing and, and turning into? Because there's still going to be a fight to get to the top of them. We've discussed a lot of the stuff we can do internally and in our mindset to get there. But where like where's the next line? What's, the, what's next? I mean, what possibly more could you do technologically to yourself to become more plugged into the world? And I'm just going to leave off on that. I mean, I, I ask you guys to think about the future because you're not just planning for, you're not fixing the what was, and you're not just doing the what is. But if you're blind to the what shall be, you're going to be left in the dust because there's other people out there who are conjuring up that environment. And like I said, identify your competition and watch what they do. You don't have to do every person. Do the first page. There's, mostly that's who you're going to be competing with. But get an idea of where they're going. Watch some of their trends. Watch some of the stuff they're doing. See if they're as in tune with the internet and the web as you are. Now, I'll answer some questions if you guys have any. If you're in a rush to get that dust on your computers, I understand. Because as soon as you dump those on there, things are going to go right to the top. Sean, I know you had a question. No, so when you were talking about all the integration and how I think sometimes we forget that a lot of these things, they're all businesses. So even the, in August, there was a lot of debate around the correlation between Google Plus Ones and PageRank. And, and, and there was a study that came out that said after Page Authority, that was the number one most influential part of what factors in the ranking for Google. And then Google came out and said, no, that's not the case. And then, and then it was called the mystery. And, and so there's a lot of that, is it or isn't it? And, but to your point about 
you know, what role does YouTube play? What role does Google Plus? Google Plus did get Facebook four or five years head start initially when it came out. And even maybe now, like, you didn't see a lot of activity on it. There were a lot of industry insiders and marketers that just sat around and talked to each other for some purpose. And so it, it, it does seem like they're going to continue to look for ways to encourage people through the integration of Google Places and Google Plus and search and, and, and all these things for, um, they're not going anywhere. So I think it, it, it's been interesting to see how, whether or not it's correlated with the rankings. It was interesting that the data came out that it, that it probably did. <laughs> and then they said, probably <laughs> so you can make the decision. But, and, and to touch on that even, uh, what he's talking about is Google's influence about how much they're really just giving their people and their tools the, the benefit of the doubt over others. First, look at the top result above the fold and identify how you can get there. I guarantee you that it's paid, maybe one or two natural organic and organic listings, and then it goes into Google Maps. So you're losing to Google Maps too. And at the same time, I know this for a fact, and this is the other thing they're gonna lie to you about. If you have AdWords, yes, it doesn't influence where I show up organically. BS. Because I'll tell you what, it does in the simple fact that Google considers your click-through rate to rank you, meaning how many people are coming to your site, and if you're paying for them to get there, it's just a raw click-through. Google doesn't differentiate between a paid and an unpaid. They're seeing it just as a click-through. So when you're paying for it, it's definitely helping you, but I have de I have seen night and day differences from when I ran a campaign to when I didn't. And it, was, it, it lends itself to the, did I need to run a campaign if I'm showing up number one organically and I'm showing up number two or one in the paid? Which one gets clicked on more? Sometimes customers use one to validate the other. Explain that again slower. Why would it make a difference? If you're saying every time there's a click through, mm -hmm. Google's like there's been a click through and, mm -hmm. them and it doesn't differentiate nope. between whether it was organic or paid. Nope, because what they're looking for is how many people have come to your piece of real estate that we gave you. If you've got a good amount of crowd coming to you, we're going to keep you there because you're going to keep attracting people. And a click-through is essentially the validation that they have that people will come there. And they're ultimately not looking at whether it was paid or unpaid. They're just looking to say, does this person warrant a position above others because people are coming to visit them? So inadvertently, you're, you're automatically creating click-throughs. But the, the downside of it is what's the value of it? You know, how, how valuable is that? Personally, did you waste time? with them, you know, did they just come there and leave? Did they skew your other stuff? Did they find you mistakenly? But, I mean, there's ultimately some key things. The, the, the two big things, too, that I, I've seen lately, and I, I, I want to touch on this real quick, um, analytics. Everyone here familiar with Google Analytics? Print your keywords as far back as you can because they're gone. You're not provided. Everyone's seen not provided. It's all the way you're going to get it now. There is no more keyword data coming from Google. Zero. Everything that comes through Google is protected now. Everything is not provided. So if you want an idea of what your customers are looking for, go print up your last as long as it'll let you print back. Because from this day, well, actually from last week forward, you will never be able to see again. It is completely secure search. The second big thing I want to talk about real quick is, as we you know, hit on some topics is the fines for fake reviews that are being issued to companies. Remember we talked about links, you can buy links. Well, the easy way to buy valuable links would be to pay $300 to some review mill in Pakistan that sends you 10,000 positive reviews. There's, I don't remember the big names of the companies. There are some big name companies out there that are facing $350,000 fines from manufacturing reviews. And God bless Yelp for pulling their card. Because Yelp had a lot to do with Google in investigating how these people were doing this, where they were doing it, and identifying who was doing it, and then finding them. So the, the real big things out there now is enjoy your keywords while you have them. Now, you'll still see them on your on your Yahoo and Bing uh, analytics. And, and you'll still see them if, if, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if they come through a, a, a refer, referred site. You're not going to see the keyword. You'll see the site that sent it to you, at least. My advice to you would be, and this is how I used to fight the not provided, more importantly to me in Google Analytics, I mean, I'll bump you on the keyword, where did it go? So in Google Analytics, for those of you very intimate with it, there's something called the secondary dimension. And you drop down that secondary dimension box, and all it does is add an additional column to the information you have in front of you. And when you have your keyword information, it's still going to be a viable link on the, on the analytics. Click on it, look at your not provided, choose secondary dimension, and go to landing page. Because that keyword that they typed in is directly correlated to where they landed on your site. You 
can lie to yourself and say they're not. I mean, most of it will end up being a slash or index or home. But above and beyond that, you can at least get some information out there. And I'm telling you, this is hot off the press about Google taking those keywords off. While we're sitting here, I guarantee there's kids figuring out APIs and scripts to put on your site to pull that keyword information down. They were already working on it on the not provided before this happened. So you better believe that there's going to be a, going to be a way, but you better be steeped in heat and eat ones and zeros for breakfast because it's going to be difficult to do. Any other questions? The search queries, that's going to be the other place you're going to be able to use. They're staying there. Okay. They're staying there. They specifically identified the search, the secure search. If you remember, for those who aren't, who aren't familiar with it, secure search was anytime you did a Google search while you were logged into your Google account. Google didn't share that information. So it kind of gave you an idea of who your customers, what customers you had that were actually logged in. Well, now you don't even have to be logged into your Google account. It's just, it, it's a nil. It's enough. But you are absolutely correct. You can use your search queries, which I fall on that, on Webmaster. Um, on Webmaster, what's the, there's a, a subtopic that that falls under. Yeah. It's on the left-hand column. They just changed it. Yes. Correct. Once again, something that takes a couple ones and zeros to connect. Not really flawless, but it seems, I think it would be. I wish it was. It seems like it is sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't work. I can never, I got a couple that I couldn't get connected at first. But. Yeah, this one's on my And what she's talking about is Google gave you the ability to correlate your analytics with the webmaster. And to go even a step further, they gave you the ability to take your analytics, your webmaster, and your AdWords. And you can mash them all together, which is kind of like the precipice of information. You know what to do with most of it, but good luck. But yeah, to do all the social. They, they're just going to keep adding tabs as you go down. And it's just going to be every one of them is a Google product. And Google's going to keep giving you that ability. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Everyone hopped up on Twitter and cold. <laughs> I really appreciate everyone coming in today. Thank you very much. Enjoy Puck Camp. Remember to take your waitresses. Any questions? I'll be around. I'll probably be at the registration table the rest of the day. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.